So it's been a very export-oriented, market-dominated economy for several thousand years, as we show in this study. And, and in fact, instead of saying this socialist is socialist, what we show is that key aspects of modern Western capitalism, the economic model that has basically become the economic model of the world, comes from Sweden. Sweden, along with other Nordic countries, is often portrayed as a successful socialist alternative to the Anglo-Saxon market economies. Yet, with a longer historical view and a deeper analysis, it may just be slightly less remarkable than we first believed. Welcome back to the IEA podcast. I'm Matthew Lesh, the Director of Public Policy and Communications here at the IEA. This podcast asks a tantalizing policy question to a top thinker each week. Today's question, is Sweden socialist? To discuss, I'm excited to be joined by Nima Sanahan Digi, who's an Iranian Swedish social science researcher and president of the European Center for Entrepreneurship and Policy Reform. He's the author of over 30 books and the co author of a new article published by the Institute of Economic Affairs academic journal, Economic Affairs, on the evolution of the Swedish market model. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Pleasure being here. So you start off uh, your new article by taking a hi- longer historical view of Sweden's history than is normally presented. Yeah. Often Swedish history begins with Viking and, and uh, era in the Middle Ages. Why have you taken that longer view and, and what can we learn from that? So, uh, you know, I, I've written this with Saeed Esmail Zadeh, Mona Esmail Zadeh and uh, Victor Strom. And we, we had discussions about this because we, we want, I do some different kinds of research with them. And we wanted to do study and we were like, okay, how about doing a historic study? Now, I, I don't actually know if this matters, but uh, t- uh, three of us uh, are Iranian Swedes, right? And in, in that cultural context, it's very typical to have a long historical view, whereas I've never seen a Swedish person have it on, on Sweden, right? And I'm very fascinated by this modern archeology, span which really um, gives us a completely I would argue a new view on what is capitalism. It's nothing new, it's a very old institution. And, and to put that in regard of Sweden, and I think one of the core elements is that the, we are not the first to say this, right? We are not the first to say that the first company with shares, one of the cornerstones of modern capitalism did not evolve as people might assume in the UK or in the Netherlands or in Italy or any or, or in the United States. I mean, these countries where typically much of people assume core elements of modern capitalism evolved. The first company with shares is Swedish. And as we show in this uh, study, several attributes, several of the key attributes of modern Western capitalism originate from Sweden. And for many thousands of years, Sweden has been a peripheral part of Europe, of Europe, of course but an important economy in Europe because of because even back way back in history, they had these big resources of copper and iron and, and forestry products and they were exporting them. So it's been a very export oriented market dominated economy for several thousand years, as we show in this study. And, and in fact, instead of saying this socialist is socialist, what we show is that key aspects of modern Western capitalism, the economic model that has basically become the economic model of the world comes from Sweden. Yeah, I think it's it's quenching. I mean, it might not be capitalist in in the the kind of, I suppose, Marxist sense of focus on capital, but certainly free market or at least market driven economics seems to have that that very long um, history that you demonstrate. I'm interested in in, uh, the point you make in the article about this is potentially because of Sweden is a fact of it being on the outskirts in the same way, I suppose, England is, is on the side that it beca- you become yeah. a trading nation and that, that it just becomes comes to you naturally that you are open to commerce because you're you're not um, part of the, the continent in the same direct way. I mean, th- th- there is that. Look, the first guy who ever writes a written historical record of Sweden, uh, this is a... Tacitus in the Roman time, like 2,100 years ago, writes the chapter in Germania. He's basically describing Germany, right? And, and then one of the passages mentions the Swedes. 
so, and, and the first encounter, written encounter with Sweden, how are they described? First of all, there is a myth that the Romans viewed everybody as barbarians, which is not, not historically accurate because clearly described the Swedes as being civilized. Now imagine, so this is way before the Viking era, by the way, it's many, many hundred years before the Viking era. We have the first written account of Sweden by, by the Romans before Jesus' birth, right? And they're described as a trading nation who are civilized. I mean, that, that's the first clue. It was just more advanced than most people believe. And another thing with archeology span is they've shown now that in Sweden and Norway, uh, they found many, many archeological uh, findings that they were producing large scale iron, iron manufacturing like 3000 years ago, before the Iron Age, right? And uh, so, so what happens essentially, if, if you want to understand the economic history, is that like something like 5,000 years ago, you have these early advanced civilizations like Sumeria, and they start within the Sumer with the temples. The temples then were religious governance and commerce, right? So you have the modern economics starting in the temples, and the Tom Karun, who are the agents between the temples, become the first capitalists. And you have you know, mathematics evolving for business. You have the first mathematical tools evolving for business, et cetera. And then 1,000 years later is like 4,000 years ago in places like Babylonia, Assyria, you have really capitalism developing. Uh, all of the things that we have in capitalism didn't exist then. Uh, I think the most um, important thing is they didn't have immaterial rights, for example, but it was very, sim I mean, very basics of capitalism existed then. And then what you have is you have these trading civilizations from the Middle East, like the Phoenic Phoenicians may be you know, important. They developed the alphabet, which, you know, I mean, the English alphabet is in several steps, continuation of that tradition. They developed trading vessels and they start trading with Europe. And I, I mean, men, and these very capitalist people, market-driven societies, they started you know, many cities across Europe. I live in Malta, of course, the Phoenicians were in Malta, but they were also found in cities in France, in the UK. Anyway, one of these trading peoples, maybe the Phoenicians, we don't actually know, they reached Sweden nearly 4,000 years ago and they become integrated in the trade network. There's a lot of findings supporting this. So Sweden becomes integrated in world trade a few centuries after the UK, just because it's a bit farther north, right? Then we go ahead like a thousand years in time, we see that there's a lot of, and, and by the way, when Sweden becomes integrated in the trade networks, they've shown that objects from the Baltic region, you can find them in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. So it was much more of an advanced trading network existing back then. If you look at a show like the Vikings, you know, the TV series, it sounds like these people that are coming from um, sort of Sweden or Norway or then, you know, they come from Kattegat, so I guess Sweden on the borderlands. Uh, anyway, they seem like they're so surprised that even finding other people and they, they have no idea what, what are Christians, they're clueless. They just came from <laughs> civilization, mm. come from a barbaric place and they're just finding out even. That's not accurate because clearly they, they've been trading with the other parts of Europe for thousands of years, right? And if you want to understand something about Sweden, and I just keep saying that important aspects of market institutions developed there, what sets Sweden and Scandinavia apart, this really doesn't fit for Denmark and Southern Sweden, but anyway, is that widespread private property ownership existed there in a way that it didn't in the rest of Europe, number one. And the reason is maybe geography. You didn't have feudalism in the same way. Uh, and the other thing is that they had rights. The people of, of these Northern uh, societies, they had legal rights, including property to much greater extent than other parts of the world. So many people would say Magna Carta is a precursor to modern capitalism and modern democracy, which I completely agree with. If you want to simplify those rights that come in Magna Carta, had existed in a country like Sweden for much longer. Clearly under the Viking age, 
there's a lot of, I really believe that much of this was, I mean, before the Viking era also, that you had private property, you had personal rights, you know, these cornerstones of modern market-oriented societies yeah. for a long time, because this is a part of Europe which is cold, so people had to work very hard to survive because of the climate. But it's also a part of the world where you had all these uh, pr private property, individual rights, for various reasons existed. I mean, even, even before the, the UK, arguably. So, okay, so yeah, getting, getting, existed. getting back to your article, you, you highlighted, you've already highlighted one of them, which is the world's first private um, company, stock company, which is yeah. the uh, full and copper mine. I mean, then also highlight that Sweden um, was key to, to banking, at least some banking innovation, but printing the first credit notes in Europe as well as the first central bank. And then I think most intriguingly, particularly for a, a British audience, uh, which is that a, a Swedish author beat Adam Smith to the punch on the world yeah. of nations. Yeah. Um, which, and I suppose that that last one, uh, which I translate to English as, as uh, the national gain, a kind of shorter spark notes mm. version of the wealth of nations designed for a mass audience. I guess what that, that, that author was writing about there was something that must have already existed within Swedish society. It, 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 yeah. they, the, the idea that of, open trade and exchange and being concerned about government intervention and subsidies and rent seeking and all that kind of stuff that that must have come from pre-existing institutions and ideas floating around in Sweden yeah I'd just like to go back to the first one and, and then I, I can go through all of this yeah yeah the first I really was really we, I mean when we're doing this we're thinking why why is this so new because I don't know anybody in Sweden themselves that that took this long historical view part right they they don't think like this in sweden either they think of themselves as a except a few archaeologists maybe who, who are doing this historic research so this thing that the first uh, company with shares evolved in sweden we are not the first to make this point but it's very un, un, underexplored and of of course one so i thought about this if you look at sweden throughout history the single most important economic venture is a copper mine in Falu. Not today, but for many, many thousand years, this was a very important mining site. And for example, in the like something like 300 years ago, the majority of all copper exports in the world were coming from this single mine. And it, this, the mining activity here goes back thousands of years. And, and then, then even before that, there was a lot of mining. So it's a huge mine, basically. So this is not a random thing that the most, I would argue, single most important economic activity in Sweden historically becomes the first company with shares. I just want to make the point that it's not a random thing. Yeah, it, and that's it, as far back as 12, I mean, yeah. 1288. So it's... it's uh, Long uh, before. Yeah, it's just a yeah. couple of hundred years after the Viking era ends, right? Okay, so we can understand why this happened. And... If you go through uh, historical accounts of Sweden and Nordic countries, they, they, all of them say that they are highly organized, hardworking people, and they have a lot of rights and le legal status. And, and uh, in the periphery, maybe not so economically developed because they are so far out, but they had very advanced advances in mining and forestry, which, by the way, still Sweden is very good at mining and forestry, so it just goes back historically. Then with banking is very interesting because something happens in the renaissance right in the renaissance you have in in italian city states which are very free and and they're very independent you have a mixture of really christian jewish islamic uh, merchants and the very advanced economic practices that then existed in the muslim world like north africa middle east uh, throughout this interaction with the jews also being very involved uh develop modern capitalism and modern capital, you know, and this is about this time, most people don't think about it, but Europeans uh, took over the mathematics from the uh, India, Persia, Arabic, you know, with the zero. So they completely changed the mathematical system in Europe in order to be better at business. We got double entry bookkeeping, we got modern banks, and we got immaterial rights. From, from the Renaissance and onwards, we get modern Western capitalism, which is just a more modern advanced version of Eastern capitalism. And then this becomes the economic model. You have all the world basically today. 
maybe not North Korea, but the rest of the world. And arguably even there, but anyway, I'm not an expert on that. Okay, so then you get banking. Modern banking existed already in Babylonia, but modern banking is an Italian Renaissance concept. Okay, mm. banks start spreading in Europe. The first bank in Sweden is late. It's in the um, uh, 17th century that Sweden gets Stockholm Bank. Now, Sweden is late in developing its first bank because they're late with everything. They're in the periphery of Europe. They were later with modern industrialization also. But the first Swedish bank revolutionizes European banking in two very crucial ways. First, they print the first European credit notes. Now, credit notes is just the basis of modern economics, right? Evolves in Sweden. And there is research that shows that- I mean, is, is this what allows you to charge interest? Is that is that the point of, of, of the credit notes is that you can- um you can start abling to um, lend out money. Is that, is that what's essential here? Well, well, it's about that 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 the ba- banks start working with credit, so essentially opening up for for advanced business, r- really, because before then they, they they were not working systematically with credit. So it's just uh, opening up for modern economics in in m- many ways. If you just imagine how how credit is used in, like. Most businesses use it today, it just becomes an uh, uh, integral part of the modern capitalist economy. Uh, and it had existed, it had existed in like, I think Asia, but never in Europe. So the Euro- and, and then what happens is modern banking, if you want to simplify it, other banks in Europe take this, right? And then you have um, elements of modern banking form. I found a, a study written in the UK, like this is a scientific study written like 200 years ago which says this, that Sweden was very late in developing banking, but the first Swedish bank changed everything. And, and then it's, uh, it started becoming adapted by other parts of Europe. Okay, so Stockholm Bank then becomes Riksbanken. It becomes the first central bank in the world. So if you think about it, three things. The first company with shares, the first central bank, the first credit notes. Now, credit notes, I mean, that's just the basis of modern finance to have credit as part of it. It's not just that you deposit money in the bank and you can take it out, but you have credit in the system. So that, that's really in invention within the European capitalist system, Western capitalist model. And then the first limit uh, company which shares in, in all the world, which I mean the cornerstone for much of economic activities, yeah. company which shares. And the first central bank, which all the world have central banks now, right? And, and again, Modern capitalism again, capital. You have central just, bank, just get... you have credit notes. So, so the capital part, not only market economy, but the capital in the capitalist system, is is also Sweden being the inventor. So these three important things shows what Sweden was peripheral, but it was a very organized society, strong property rights. Uh, very decentralized, wasn't mm. as hierarchical, be, just because people had had ownership, many people owned their own lands. It was not a feudal system, right? So just, so- just moving back on then to uh, the point about, so we've got the um, the notes, the central bank yeah. um, companies. We also have the ideas here and, and predating yeah. Adam, Adam Smith and uh, some of those you talk about. Um, do you, do you yeah. want to look back on that? And also, I, I'm just to ask, what, what kind of, influence did that writing have because we have, you know there's yeah. good research just the wealth of nations was um universally read in uh by british intellectuals yeah. more or less in in the um 19th century or it was you know very widely that a man of letters would have a copy of the wealth of nations in their library is it the kind of equivalent phenomenon um, for the work you're talking about so on on the Sidenius is uh finnish swedish it's important to realize that Finland and Sweden were same country then, or Finland was part of Sweden. It was a Finnish Swedish intellectual who uh, wrote the book, De Nationella Winston, The National Prophet, very similar title also to Adam Smith. He writes in the beginning that he intentionally wrote, wrote, wrote a pocketbook because he wanted people to have it in their pockets. He wanted politicians, you know, uh, captain of a ship, people in business having the book in their pockets. So he wrote a very short book which is very similar to the Wealth of Nations, although it's much shorter. 
because the wealth of nations is very long. This, this is quite short, but it's very basic, basic like free market, uh, gives the intellectual understanding for losses for capitalism, gives the, I mean, it has the same point that each nation is like a business. You need to have a profit in the nation. You need to create wealth for the nations. And, and so it's not a coincidence that even the title is very similar to Adam Smith's. And this book is presented in the Swedish parliament 11 years before Wealth of Nations is printed in, in London, right? So it's before. And uh, you said, was it influential? First of all, even today in Finland, under Sidenius is a hero, like they celebrate him once a year. They have a day when they remember under Sidenius. So in Finland, he's big. In Sweden, no. In Sweden, he's much, much less well known. Like intellectual people might know of under Sidenius. Sidenius also plays an important part in another thing, which arguably is not as important, but also a cornerstone of. I mean, if you look at democratic capitalism in the West being a model, I mean, these two are connected, right? Uh, Sidenius was um, is credited as being the main person who wrote something. And it was the first freedom of the press bill that, that became part of the Swedish constitution, which I, I argue that freedom of the press is a part of democratic capitalism. So, so, so you see that as an intellectual, he was ahead of his time also in this regard. When he wrote this, it was very influential, right? When Sidenius writes this, and I'm, I have a reference in the article that he wasn't completely isolated. There is like we, we mentioned some other economists also who had a, somewhat similar ideas. I think Sidenius shows that uh, economic freedom ideals existed in Sweden at the time. Uh, and and in, in Swedish history, there is a freedom era uh, where like uh, three, 400 years ago, I'm not exactly, you know, what they said. They had an era of freedom, which then you had a backlash and then, you know, went back. But in the freedom era of, of Sweden, uh, they were very much ahead of the rest of the world in having democratic and capitalist societies that were egalitarian. I, I will make an argument here that one of the one thing we don't think about because we take it for granted is that Europeans, Christianity to, to be even more frank, revolutionized the planet is the egalitarian idea that all people are worth the same towards the state, like a man and a woman have the same legal rights, et cetera, right? And, and so Sweden, in this regard, I can't say it was the number one country in the world because it, this thing did happen in like American states like Maine and Delaware. You had the British suffrage movement. I mean, clearly those were important too. But the last thing that really is Sweden's contribution to modern Western capitalism is opening it up to everybody, opening it up to women. And, and this historically happened early in Sweden also. So, so there, there's another more modern version. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, really from the first limited company to opening up capitalism for everybody, for including women, Sweden has been an important driver in the, because most people just assume that capitalism is an Anglo-Saxon completely like the British invented it, Americans fine-tuned it. Maybe you start reading history, you say, oh, certain elements come from the Dutch. Or you say, oh, okay, modern capitalism evolved in Italy with this Eastern tradition going to the West. And they forget that, that we should make a point. Sweden played a key role in this. And then this, art, this idea that Sweden is socialist, I mean, it has- Let's, 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 move, let's move forward there a bit, yeah. because yeah. Um, you've, you've given a kind of very you know, fascinating historical explanation for yeah. uh, an historical view just to suggest you know, Sweden is not historically a, a particularly socialist place, and in fact, quite the opposite. I think a, a potential retort to this would then be, you know, that's that's all very interesting. Yeah. But um, of course, what, what happened then is you, know, you could even make, potentially make a historical determinist argument in a Marxist sense that, okay, well, Sweden was early on the capitalism, but then uh, they were early on uh, moving to the next stage of, in the Marxist view of economic oh God, development. Yeah. And, and then they, they became socialist in the post-war era. I wonder if you want to talk to, talk to that a bit. Um, and, and I think people point often to things like Sweden having very high levels of taxes, uh, very high levels of um, uh, guaranteed public provision of, of services, 
Um, and despite yeah. what you're trying to say, that what doesn't necessarily represent modern day Sweden, which is a you know strong social democratic, if not you know socialist leaning country. I mean, okay, first of all, again, in the same article, we make two points about this. Number one is if you want to measure how much of a market economy country is, I think the best metric is the index of economic freedom, right? Currently, Sweden and every other Nordic country is ranked, again, look at the paper, we didn't make this up, is ranked as being more free market than the UK and the US. Now, you might say this is crazy. Why? And we show, we show in the article why this is. For example, in the US, they're spending a lot of money. The government is spending money they don't have. I, I heard this number that like, if they have $1 in tax revenues in the U US, they're actually spending $1.7, the, the central government, right? So they're spending money they don't have, which is completely irresponsible and they can do it for the short term because the dollar is the world currency. But, you know, and then look at Sweden and these countries. They are every year, Sweden is every year paying off their foreign debt, which is one of the lowest, lower ones in the world, right? They're very fiscally conservative, whereas Americans are spending. So, and, and the index of economic freedom gives America, I think, the score zero in fiscal freedom, which I agree with. I mean, what other country could do that? It's not responsible. And it's like, oh, they have a smaller tax burden. They're spending money they don't have. So, so in many, 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 if you look at the index of economic freedom, you see that in many, many areas, Sweden and every other Nordic country are more free market than the US and UK because they generally have pretty free markets, very free trade freedom, and they are fiscally conservative. The only thing that, that draws them back is the high tax burdens. I completely agree. Having a tax burden of 40% or more of GDP is very bad. It destroys, it just stops economic development happening. It's not constructive. And a lot of what's happened in Sweden is, is on moving away from that. Uh, Sweden, the last, currently has a center right government, right? The last government was Social Democrat. Let's go to the last government Sweden had, the former government, the Social Democrat government. What were their two big reforms? privatizing employment services and cutting, abolishing the 5% highest tax on earnings, just abolishing it. I, I don't see that quite as being, you know, this country is socialist, they're moving in a Marxist direction. So, so that's one point we make. Another point we make in this article, we made an uh, image to just show this, uh, that we, we, we took the 30 countries in the world that have the highest level of economic liberty and just plotted them, their economic freedom scores and their taxes as sort of GDP scores. And then you say, yes, indeed the Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Norway are outliers because they have a high tax burden and, and still a high level of economic freedom, which is very unusual. Iceland doesn't have that high taxes. So there is one Nordic country which has clear like what have like thirty five percent of GDP taxes like a normal tax rate. Okay, yes, they do have high tax rates. Yes, they and if you want to understand Sweden, let's just talk about Sweden. No European country has as many engineers and and researchers as sure of the adults as Sweden has. No European country spends as much as on research and uh, development as share of GDP as Sweden does. It's in many ways the leading knowledge economy of Europe or the second, depending on metrics, right? And, and the growth is still pretty stagnant because of the high taxes, because of the welfare dependency, all of that. So this thing with the Sweden and other Nordic countries having a high tax rate is more of a trap they're stuck in. And, and they're trying to reform from that. Uh, this is my interpretation. Of course, if you talk with a Swedish person who who's like has a more left-leaning ideology, maybe they would say it differently. But you don't have socialism being a driving force in Swedish society. I, yeah, I, I think the, the, you the, don't the, have that. 
the central point is that Sweden does not have uh, a system where the government controls the, the means of production. It has a, a thriving private market economy with a relatively high levels of state spending. But other than where I, I think there's a big distinction here, and arguably the UK is a lot more socialist yeah. than Sweden, is in terms of how public services are provided. And I, I think mm. particularly in the, the the biggest employer in the UK is, of course, the National Health Service. And they, oh, yeah, they, yeah. They, 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 there's a good line which says, you know, the Soviet Union may have died, but central planning is well alive and yeah. thriving in the NHS. I think my understanding is that the Swedish healthcare system is is a lot more market driven, despite it being publicly funded. It's provided by, by private businesses. I, I think this is interesting because let's just look at this from the uh, feminist perspective. So if you look at Sweden, which we write in this paper, one of the core things is Opening up modern capitalism to women was, was one of the things Sweden was very early on. We don't make the claim it was first because, again, Delaware, Maine, UK also were early. Like, or even Muhammad, Muhammad, you know, the prophet's wife was a big merchant capitalist for what, 1,400 years ago. So it's not completely new. But if you look at Sweden, uh, they had a pretty lost uh, libertarian style economic model for a long time. For example, when a Great Depression hits the world, Sweden and all the other Nordic countries are first hit very hard, but then they recover. You don't have this American theme of the long depression because the government barely intervened. They had low taxes, free markets, and the government was like, oh, we're not going to do so much. And the market just, you know, uh, created the jobs. And one of the things in Sweden was because of their setting in the like an early modern age, they had many pretty many women in business, right? And one of the things people don't realize is when Sweden shifts to these socialist uh, ideals in the, after the second after the Second World War, you could say, one of the big things they do is the government monopolizes big parts of the economy and they only monopolize those parts of the economy where, where a majority of the um, business owners are women. So the government goes in, in education. Many of the schools in Sweden have been formed by public for-profit companies, often run by women, the government said, no, government monopoly. Many health healthcare, of course, you have many women, they say, no, healthcare is a government monopoly. Elderly care, many women, no, public monopoly. Pharmacies, you have relatively high share of women involved in pharmacies, right? Government monopoly. Even staffing agencies, government monopoly. And then you can look at modern statistics, Every part of the economy where half or majority of those running the business are women, Sweden at, at this socialist era made a government monopoly, right? It was never about monopolizing anything men did, right? This socialist idea, and, and I, this escapes many people. I, I wrote this book, Henry, uh, Henry Ford's of Healthcare for Economic Affairs on this also. A lot of what the economic socialist policies of Nordics, but also Western Europe, including UK, is about Europeans being so progressive, still have an idea that it's morally wrong to make money on women's work, which you don't really have this as much in the Middle East, which you think of they're not as feminist, but they don't have this idea as much, or the Chinese for that matter. So th this is why you have more, many more women billionaires in China than Europe. So one of the things that has been happening in this since the 1990s is that opening up again these areas of the economy, education, healthcare, etc., for okay vouchers and market model, and it's been a big boost for women's enterprise. So this is often seen as this Marxism, planned economy, etc. Myself, I have a slightly different view on it. And I believe that the, there's a paradox. This is if you've read the book, The Nordic Gender Equality Paradox, is that the Nordic and Western European people don't themselves realize that a lot of this debate with the NHS and everything is, is rooted in a cultural belief that it is morally wrong to make money on certain things. And it just happens to be women's work, women's market work. I mean, can you give me any example of the, the same debates that the government should monopolize industry or mining or any male dominated activity. I'd, I'd be careful here since uh, in the UK, of course, the government did at least for a period own the mines and uh, own the telecommunications, et cetera, as well. So it's not um, universal, but I think I take your point yeah. that a lot of these 
um, softer skills, um, you know, community serv- perceived as community services are often delivered in large numbers by women. And of course, you know, women are the, the backbone of the NHS. Men yeah. probably are doctors in higher numbers, but certainly nurses and support other support staff are, are undoubtedly women um, in high numbers as well. So I think that's a, an interesting point. Yeah. So I'm just kind of getting through um, uh, a kind of f- final thought here um, as, as we're uh, uh, kind of coming to time here. So you've got this transformation you're talking about here where for a relatively short period of time, this is, I suppose, when the perception was created in the, in the post-war era, Sweden um, you know, went along with some socialistic policies, probably not uniquely, you know, the UK also had, went along with a lot of socialistic policies in the post-war era. Yeah, and yeah. then you note that that basically started reversing in the 80s and 90s and, and even more into today. Um, another interesting element of it, and I don't know if you want to finish on this, which is um, you, you, you have this, this idea about um, values and particularly as a oh, yeah. society, Sweden has um, is very cohesive. There's a lot of um, ideas, it's quite unique in, in the uh, World Values Survey where it's positioned in terms of self-expression and secular values um, with high levels of um, trust as well. I, yeah. And then you suggest that that leads to two things. One is a welfare, a kind of strong welfare state and high tax and spend, but also more decentralized bureaucracy that um, in Sweden, as a result of the fact that, that people kind of trust the bureaucratic system a little bit more, um, you, you, you can have a big state, but you can also have, I suppose, a decentralized state in the way the UK doesn't have a particularly decentralized state. Yeah, my, my cat is jumping up, up under what's <laughs> happening here. Uh, he wants to be on camera too. Uh, so let me just say that this research, you, you know, uh, working with the Esmails are the siblings who have, you know, their, their companies. And one of the things was like, okay, let's do research which is relevant for the businesses they're doing. And one of the core elements is like decentralization right? Decentralized management is a very Swedish thing. Uh, decentralized business uh, management. And, and, and something that goes hand in hand with that is that Sweden and other Nordic countries have very high trust levels. And they've shown that if you look at America, the people who have the highest trust to strangers are the descendants of Scandinavians. Although uh, they're, um, you know, it's, many of them like 200 years ago, 100 years ago, immigrated to the US. So the, the high levels of trust are the Nordic gold, because if you have high levels of trust, and I want to say this, Sweden has much higher trust levels than even Germany and the UK, right? As, as we have an article, I think we have those numbers. It's a different thing. It's a very high trust country. Uh, and these very unusual Swedish norms are important. First of all, everybody wants to say, why did Sweden go so socialist in the 70s? What happened? You, you know, one of the reasons is they had so high trust. And, and then they had such incredible, almost difficult to understand working ethics that they could make a big welfare state. And people were like, I'm not going to use welfare anyway. And then this changed. And then they have to reform it. Uh, but, but if you want to understand Nordic society, you have to understand that particularly Sweden is the outlier in the cultural map that they make with the World Value Survey. It's farthest out in the axis of self-expression values and secular values. And it's very complex to explain this, but basically uh, it's a lot to do with high levels of trust and at least traditionally very strong working ethics. And I believe that all of these things are due to two factors. The first one is it's so cold and unforgiving being a farmer in Sweden or Finland, these countries. They had to be very hardworking, very organized, and have a solidarity. But the solidarity was not about living, mooching off others. The solidarity was if your neighbor is starving, feed him, because you're going to be starving next year if the, your crop is bad. Uh, and the other thing is, as I said, they didn't have feudalism. They had a lot of like, like Magna Carta style rights in Sweden before other parts of Europe, right? So, um, so I think this can explain, because Russia, for example, the Russians also lived in a cold country, but in Russia was the complete opposite. Instead of having a lot of rights, many people were sort of serfs. There was like, many people were, maybe not slave is not the right word, but they didn't own anything. They had very little freedoms. So. So the combination of having rights and ownership and living in a cold, unforgiving climate, I think is 
you have to see as explanation for these very unique norms of trust and working ethics and responsibility ethics that evolve in Sweden. And really the country throughout its history is a trade dependent country, always been, uh, which gave birth to key parts of market economy and the Swedish way of management with these very decentralized models is um, you know, very attractive for the modern knowledge economy. So if I want to summarize everything, I'd say that the only problem Sweden has is the high tax burden. And they're very, very slowly normalizing it down. So once they normalize this um, <laughs> last socialist element, it will be really be Europe's leading knowledge economy. And me and I guess some others really hope that Sweden will manage, so the cat comes the camera, manage this thing with the shifting away from, from socialism, hopefully, because it, it's not helping them. The thing so that is so, so, good so, for Sweden is not good, I, I argue, for Sweden, yeah. So, so Sweden is uh, special, but not that special and becoming uh, arguably a little bit less social and certainly less socialist than um, people often claim in public yeah. debate. Yeah, thank you. I mean, even unexceptionalism, it's not exceptional, it's just a typical pattern. If you have technology, if you have business, working ethics, trust, things go well. If the government comes and stiffens everything with monopolies and taxes, things go bad, just like every other country in the planet. Well, Nima, thank you so much for joining the IA podcast. It's been a truly fascinating podcast. For those who are interested in learning more about this topic, uh, you've written various books that touch on it, as well as this um, article for the latest edition of Economic Affairs, the IEA's academic journal, which is the evolution of the Swedish market model. If you're enjoying the IEA podcast, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel or on your chosen podcast provider. Thank you very much. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.